from residents about your experiences and your views on resident involvement in social housing and how that can manage your homes better. I want to be clear that we're not here to talk about regeneration, but about all the things that, that fall short of knocking down your homes, the, the, the daily management. Um, and the reason we're here is, is this is part of our work as a, an assembly uh, following the Grenfell Tower disaster. Um, this has really focused all our minds on how we do the management of our homes and how well that's done uh, actually is a matter of not just health and safety but can be life and death. Um, and we're very concerned to learn from what happened and we as an assembly we can uh, be more fleet of foot, more agile than the, the long public inquiry that's just been started and we think we can, with your help, learn some of those lessons and make some good recommendations um, quite soon. So, so that's why we're doing this. Um, we invited Grenfell United, we've met with them to talk about their issues. Um, they are, have just started the public inquiry and they have a big meeting tonight so they couldn't uh, be here today. Um, but one of the, I wanted to read out one of the things they've said um, in the run-up to the inquiry um, that highlights the reason we're here and the, the reason why it's so important to get social housing management right. What they said is, for many years, our concerns, our worries, our voices were overlooked. We're a diverse and hard-working community. We live in social housing but come from all walks of life. Teachers, social workers, business people. We played by the rules, did everything that was asked of us raised concerns through all the proper channels and were completely ignored by, with the, by those with the power to help us. Now, we need to discuss how we can prevent that happening again, not just the fire, but residents who feel like that about their landlords. So, yet to, to start the, the meeting, what we're going to be doing um, is breaking it down into four themes. Um, first one is resident involvement in decision making, then acting on complaints, then legislative duties and gaps there, and best practice. We want to hear about some things that work well. And from each of those, uh, we'll hear from a speaker who's been uh, coordinated by the London Tenant Federation. And we have to thank the London Ten Tenant Federation hugely for the amount of work they've put into making this meeting work. Um, and then they will speak for about four minutes, and then we'll open up to everybody um, sitting on the seats around us for open mic, um, for contributions from you, um, for about 10 minutes after that. So if everyone can try and keep their <coughs> contributions as short as possible, then we'll hear from more people. Um, and if when you're speaking you see me or another assembly member uh, waving crazily at you, <laughs> um, that means please can you, you know, wrap up in as, as one more sentence. Um, what we want to hear from you are your conclusions um, and the details we want to hear from you in, in writing, if possible. Um, we have um, hashtags and, and Twitter feeds up there. Uh, we also have an, an email address that, that you can send things to. And we've provided comment cards around the room. So that if you feel like there's something you're not going to be able to get out in two minutes, you can write more details onto that comment card, um, say who you are. Um, and when you speak, can you also say who you are and, if possible, where you live and what kind of tenant you are, because that will help us. This meeting, I need to remind you, is going to be webcast and is being webcast now and is going to be transcribed as part of our evidence um, so just to let you know about all of that but it means that everything you say will be will be taken down and, and used by us and anything you put in the comments will be as well so that's a very long introduction and lots of housekeeping but i hope that'll make it run smoothly um, and the first thing i'm going to do is um, introduce pat turnbull um, she's from the london tenant federation um, and a xi'an housing association tenant. She represents also the Hackney Residents Liaison Group um, and is going to, to introduce uh, the first topic which is resident involvement in decision making. So if you want to ask, if you want to make comments about that then get ready to put your hands up in the moment. Thank you Pat. Right, can you hear me? Yes. That's good. Um, well hello to the Housing Committee members and hello to everybody else. Um, we tenants live in our homes and nobody knows, knows them better than we do. And yet it often seems as if we are the last... Oh, you need to be put down. It's so short, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, you Andrew, thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. 
Yet it often seems as if we are the last people to be listened to when our homes are the question under discussion. Um, as Shan has said, the terrible Grenfell Tower fire showed the worst that can happen when tenants are ignored, sidelined and regarded as unimportant, with 72 people having lost their lives and everybody having lost their homes. And this is why London Tenants Federation regards it as extremely urgent that the reduction and fragmentation of tenant representation that has been going on for so long should be reversed and that tenants should be listened to. We want self-organised, democratically elected tenants and residents associations to be given the support and respect they deserve. We want boroughs to re-establish the borough-wide representative federations that have now been closed down in all but a very few places. Ideally, we would like a return to the days when borough housing committees included tenants in their composition instead of current structures where even most councillors have very little say. We want the Mayor of London to set a good example by restoring in an even better and more representative form than it was in before the London Housing Forum, which his predecessor allowed to wither and die. And we have asked as a London Tenants Federation that this should happen, and so far we haven't had a positive response. So we hope we will. We want the Mayor of London to place conditions for real and meaningful tenant and resident organisation on landlords who are seeking his approval, and in particular his cash. We cannot help suspecting that tenant voices are being sidelined because our defence of our homes and our estates is inconvenient for a certain proposed agenda for London. But we are the voices of so many of the people who live here, and we know what kind of London will be good for ordinary Londoners to live in and what will not. On the big and small issues, our voices need to be an important, maybe even the most important part of the conversation. So I hope that you will find what we have to say useful and worth listening to. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, so our first topic is going to be introduced by, by Assemblymember Copley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, this is uh, resident involvement in decision making. Uh, through our call for evidence, we heard from social housing landlords that resident involvement is done on multiple levels, from an estate-based involvement to an organisational borough-wide involvement in multiple forms, from online surveys to board membership, and finally for multiple reasons, from improving service delivery to strategic decision making. The London Tenant Federation will give us some insights into how resident involvement changed over time and shared their own experience of effective resident engagement in decision making. We would then like to hear from you about your thoughts about what works and what matters for resident involvement. Now we've got two speakers, um, Ron Ho Hollis from Lambeth Council, uh, who's a Lambeth Council tenant representative, and Molly Ayrton, who's a Genesis Housing Association tenant. So could I ask Ron to uh, come up first of all? Thank you. Um, just a slight correction. I don't represent Lambeth Council. I represent their tenants. Yes, so Lambeth <laughs> Council tenant representative. Yeah. Um, in online IT support, there's a shorthand used, IUT wanted. And that strange word means it used to work and now it doesn't. This is an apt description of the current state of resident participation in Lambeth. On your committee's website it says, and I paraphrase, the past half century has seen a focus on the importance of resident involvement with residents association playing an increasing role in the governance and management of social housing stock. I'm afraid few of us would recognise that as a describing contemporary experience. Residents' experience in Lambeth is typical of the situation in most boroughs, so I will concentrate on that. There was a period when resident engagement was meaningful, with considerable powers of examining the council and actively engaging in the management of housing at every level from the mundane to the strategic, being meaningfully involved in making decisions about our homes. Residents helped push Lambeth from a position where it was notoriously badly managed to a place where problems had been identified and an ambition to be better were entrenched. For example, they were the first to request peer group benchmarking the first to argue for strategic planning that went beyond the next financial year. Over the last couple of years, since the Alma was closed and Lambeth took back direct management of its homes, resident participation has been allowed to wither, 
drowned in mountains of paper, but losing all power to make decisions. It has now been replaced with a system involving far fewer residents, some of whom are selected by officers, and already faces more papers and, and has even fewer powers. It is typical that Lambeth's proposals require that members of the new scrutiny board are not allowed to criticise the council in public, which demonstrate the mindset behind those proposals. Lambeth's interactions with its residents have so, fallen so far down the council's agenda that senior officers do not even know what it entails. As an example, the notorious Walkabout Wednesdays presented by Lambeth officers to the committee in their evidence claimed that estates were inspected on a regular basis every couple of weeks by Lambeth housing managers. For clarity, across the whole borough, there is one inspection every two weeks, allowing for weather and holidays equating to about 20 or so a year. Given that there are over 200 estates, this suggests that each one might get a visit every eight years. After challenges from residents, this policy has been dropped. New policies, though, have yet to be revealed. The, local, the current local authority environment, with its cabinet governance, has removed all vestiges of interaction for most people with council policies. Even ordinary councillors seem to struggle to be well informed. Pre the cabinet system, housing committees were always well attended with extensive resident participation. Residents, particularly from tenants council and East Hill council executive, have the opportunity to rigorously examine the council's performance and propose ways of improving the management of their homes. Residents also had a huge depth of historical knowledge, often otherwise lost, that was invaluable in informing council debate and decisions. In Lambeth, there are now no formal channels through which residents can engage with their landlord other than at my tap is leaking level. There is no resident engagement on a pan borough level, none at a strategic level, no way of influencing the future of our homes in Lambeth. For people to be involved in making decisions about the key things that affect their lives is the basis of a healthy democratic society. Though we now seem to be approaching a dystopian corporatocracy, we must fight back for the principles of democratic society. I understand the limitations of the GLA's power, but the Mayor can act by establishing, recognising and supporting good practice by involving residents at every stage in developing housing policy within GLA and by requiring local authorities to show that they follow such good practice as part of bids for funding or other support from the GLA. Thank you very much. Uh, Molly, could you, uh, could you come up now? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> right. yes, I'm Molly Ayton. Um, I'm a member of a residence organisation which supports the rights of tenants, leaseholders and shared owners. Um, I'm a resident of the recently merged Notting Hill and Genesis, and I've been a resident for 39 years. Um, most of what I am say is going to come from experience. The 2016 Housing Act has deregulated housing associations, which allows them, without public scrutiny, to sell off our social homes and change their constitution in order to downgrade their social ethos. Our merged organisation, Notting Hill and Genesis, no longer provides social housing as the main object in its rule. There are no elected residents on any committees of the newly merged Notting Hill Genesis, nor was there any in the previous associations. <coughs> The example, the Customer Service Committee of Genesis, was created in 2016 without any discussion with the residents. There are three resident representatives who were selected in secret. The basis for their selection is not known, and I do not know if the committee still exists. In Genesis Housing, the resident board members were selected by the board. They've earned Six and a half, no, 6,500 per year in 2016. We know nothing about the process of selection except that there were interviews in 2017. The criteria used make up of interviewing panel, sorry, um, what was asked all remains a secret. And we do not know how the two resident representatives on the Notting Hill Genesis board were chosen. We do not know how they vote, what they say in meetings, or what they are paid. This kind of fraudulent representation seems to be the norm. The lack of democracy also extends 
to so-called consultations with residents. The consultation with Genesis Housing Association and Notting Hill Housing about the merger is still a secret. 170,000 residents have no idea of what the results of the consultation was. They had no vote in their future and a request for the ballot was rejected. This means that all forms of resident representation tends to be a selection process where token cherry-picked residents are selected by the board and led to support decision, decisions the board want. All this conducted in secrecy as no resident sees board meeting minutes or knows how resident representatives vote. It is completely a process which undermines the social purpose of housing associations. Thank you. Right, we've, got, uh, we've only got a short amount of time. Do I see people who wish to make a contribution? Yeah, we've got some mics coming around. The uh, you, sir, in, in, in the blue check shirt, there's a mic coming down. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name's Liam Kelly. I yeah. got, got you, I think. Yeah, it should yeah. be on there. You hear me now? There you go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 my name's Liam Kelly. I'm an independent housing consultant. I've lived and worked in social housing for 25 years and I fully endorse what both speakers have said uh, and appreciate we're short on time, but essentially over the last 25 years we've seen a massive decline in the way participation is done from a more participatory level to a really consumerist, tokenistic level. And I think part of that is the fact that we no longer have external pressure on organisations which was around when the Housing Corporation and the Order Commission were there. And obviously around those times also, there was what's called the best value regime and the large scale stock transfers, which made it imperative for housing associations to project themselves as genuinely engaging with their residents. That pressure no longer exists. So we need some kind of external pressure to bring that in because left to their own devices, there isn't going to be any meaningful change. There's no motivation, there's no plan for it. Most housing associations don't see a business case for engaging residents, which is very short-sighted. Uh, the best model, in my opinion, for meaningful engagement is with the right to manage, with a TMO. Clearly, um, Kenton and Chelsea was very much an anomaly in how TMOs are. Most TMOs are smaller and behave much better and have much stronger representation and, and connection with their residents. Housing associations now have voluntary right to buy. Uh, why not put pressure on them to have right to manage as well? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the gentleman behind you, yeah, if you just pass the mic back. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dan McCurry, I live in, in Tower Hamlets. So I live in a, a block about the size of Grenville. And the other day, there was a, some kind of technical catastrophic failure happened and both lifts went down. And the Housing Association didn't know about it, even 24 hours later. So we've got people with mobility issues living at the top of a block and so on, you can imagine. And I think the reason why it was such chaos and they didn't know about it is because housing officers were effectively abolished a few years ago. There is no connection between housing associations and the blocks anymore. And I think this happened around about the time when George Osborne wanted to get down the, um, the um, housing benefit bill and he wanted the best, most efficient system as possible, which is not a stupid policy, but the problem is that they did get rid of all the housing officers and now there isn't a relationship between the housing association and the residents. So in our case, like this, for 24 hours, both lifts were off, no one knew about it and it caused mass chaos. Uh, and I think that housing officers have a really important role which should be brought back, which is just that connection of who do you speak to and who is responsible. Okay, we have someone right at the back, just there. Hello, good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Victor Digby from uh, Newham Union of Tenants. Uh, one of the problems I could see is that uh, pre-2010, we have a lot of... Uh, Tenants federations all over London. But after Conservative came up in 2010, and with all the new regulations and everything, all local authorities, they started shutting down federations. And this is one of the big problems. Because when we had the federation, 
we had what you call in my new hand, borough wide tenants licensing committee. We could summon directors of council to queries and then build complaints. We were able to get things done. On monitoring, we monitor them, we do everything. But since then, and they, since the mayor, they did impact, uh, impact assessment for him. They thought that he could save 153,000 annually, which was contribution from every tenant of Tempe every week from the rent. And then he shut down the federation. Since then, everything went down. So what I would suggest, the way forward is that we have to restate tenant representation. And then at the same time, in the council, you must have resident involvement involvement team that will deal with residents. So and all this action has to be taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, Liz, 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 Liz is just here. Um, thanks. My name is Lizzie Spring. I rent from Women's Pioneer Housing Association in North Kensington. Um, I'm really interested in what you said, Tom, when you started with all the things that the housing associations and councils are telling you they do to involve us. I think I, st I started a tenants association in frustration after failing to have any um, conversation of equals with the senior staff of my landlord. And I've resigned twice over the years as chair because it's intensely frustrating repeatedly. Mm. Going in as a sort of plaintiff when you're trying to, as Molly said and, and Pat said, talk as experts about your own homes. I think what a lot of us want, not just because of Grenfell, because we were saying this in North Ken for five or six years beforehand, is far more agency and authority and ways that tenants are actually in governance and decision-making roles, not involved or engaged, but actually having oversight and being able to be elected onto the boards, have an equal role on the boards, not, as several people have said, um, be chosen by the um, current board or staff members. But also we need a, another, a new national tenant's voice. And I think a lot of us are very, I was on the original one that was closed down a week after the coalition government got in. And it was 50 tenants from right across the country, all different sorts of social housing tenures, so co-ops, councils and housing associations. We were chosen very rigorously through a huge um, interview process that went on for several months. And then we met regularly with each other. We were given a huge amount of information about housing policy and, um, and taught how to input into it. And the idea was to have a direct um, link both into the, what was then, I think we still had the GLC then, the GLA started, <laughs> um, and, the, and um, whoever the housing minister was. It was hugely hideous, overused word, empowering, because it was around us as experts talking with politicians and decision makers as experts, and then recommending back how the um, staff of our, our, our landlords improved, rather than us trying to talk to those landlords. The little question I put in, I will stop now, I promise, but the little question I put in before we came was, how can we together with you help the landlords stop being so resistant to co-production? To, I'd love right to manage for housing associations. Um, it's, it's completely impossible even to have a conversation as an equal with the senior staff of my housing association, let alone in any way think about them ceding any real power to us. So I think what I'd love, and I'm sorry because Sean and Tom have heard me say this before, is to have regular fora in here for us to actually work out how to do that and to really bring together tenants as equals across the city and then make recommendations which go back to the landlords so that we actually turn it round and become in charge of the agenda. Thank you very much. Have we got time for one, one more? We've got until, yeah, we've got six minutes. Oh, go, go, go more. Yes, Three, the gentleman just here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name's Terry McGrenra and I'm a council tenant and I have been for the last 30 years, later, later, laterally, with uh, Tor Hamlet's homes. Uh, all this week, actually, I've been at the Grenfell Tower Inquiry and it, during its commemorative phase. And it is rather uh, sad, actually, because 
A lot of the examples that we heard were from people who were dead. And it is sad that we only hear from tenants when they're dead rather than when they're alive. And that is totally and utterly wrong. I would like you to refer to you to the editorial. It's only a couple of sentences, so don't worry. In yesterday's Times for the, for the record, 23rd of May. Giving a voice to victims and their families is not only an empowering and respectful process, it is helpful in dissuading those proposed, pre-proposed, to regard any inquiry as an, as an establishment stitch-up. Last sentence. The inquiry that the public demands is one that investigates the social causes of this tragedy as much as the physical. I will confine my comments to personal examples, or one example of one estate, and it's, it's pertinent because the Mayor of London opened this particular development last September. It's called Watts Grove in Tar Hamlets. It was the Tar Hamlets flagship development housing project. It was decided, the design was decided without any involvement of tenants whatsoever. They were given a fate accompli. Like it or not to like it, too bad. When it opened, or just after it opened, I wrote to the chief executive of Tar Hamlet's Homes to point out various uh, teething problems. I got no reply. All those teething problems were I suggested that there should be a community hall for 148 residents and not to have a community hall is a disgrace. But the officer in charge of the development says, no, no, there's too many uh, community halls. And also, as regards my own experiences of Tar Hamlet's homes, they've cut down, as the gentleman said also from Tar Hamlet's, the number of housing officers the number of housing offices. They have basically sort of reduced our contact with the uh, Tar Hamlet homes to a call centre instead of a personal one-to-one. -one. So oh, in sorry, conclusion... I think we need to, to get someone else in, so can you right. bring it to a close? Thank, yeah. thank you. In conclusion, the purpose of housing providers as it is at the moment, is to save money and not to serve us. That must change. Thank you very Thank much. You we could go, uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt at the back there. Come to next. Oh, careful, yes, don't um, drop the glasses. Hello. Hi, my name's Harry Hall. I'm from Kingston. Um, I'm chair of the Federation of Residents in Kingston as well. Um, I think one of the things that we need to start looking at is to start holding councils and housing associations to task. For example, in Kingston, before the old administration decided that they wanted to whittle down the way that the residents could get involved with any decision making. Um, before that, we had lots and lots of ways going. We had our own committees at Guildhall, etc., etc. Uh, it got down to we were allowed to go to one meeting with one representative and with no vote. So we can give advisory advising, and I argued with the chair a lot because she used to try and shut me up. Um, and we could advise, but we couldn't actually vote on what they were making decisions on. Um, but for, as a federation's point of view, I think we were probably the last, last federation in, Kings, uh, in London to actually have grants. Um, that ended last year. Um, when the ad old administration decided that they were going to put resident engagement out to tender. The people that actually won it was a self-confessed private company who have never done resident engagement in their lives, and they actually con self-confessed that. And when you ask them to do things on residents' behalf, so something as simple as photocopying, the answer is, we can't do that for you. So. They expect 
people to do stuff for them but don't give them the facilities to do it even when you have a resident engagement company mm. who have never done resident engagement um, which means that the re residents that were represented them before like federation like who have funding lost their funding to a company that doesn't even know what they're doing and that's uh, and that's why the gla have got to have some way to enforce things that people can go to and say right they've done this sort it out because <laughs> it's not working Thank you. Um, I think that's going to bring that section to a close. There's going to be more opportunities, though, don't worry, uh, as, we, uh, yeah. as we continue. So, um, Sean. Great, yeah. Those of you who couldn't contribute just then, please write on the comments sheets. Any of you who want to add any more information, please write on the comments sheets for us. Um, I've got one tweet to do with this section that I, I should read out to yep. come through on the hashtag, um, your voice. Um, Andy Plum, and this is something we're going to have to look up, I think. Um, he says that the uh, National Federation of Tenant Management Organisations, TMOs, show that 70% of TMOs outperform the local authorities that they're based in on the KPIs, the key performance indicators um, that they set for themselves. So in, in theory, that means, that means that they're the higher performing if they're tenant management organisations. Um, and more support for TMOs comes from um, a Twitter um, user called Ben Beck, who says there's just two of them in Lewisham, but 17 in Southwark, which is next door. Um, so clearly some councils could do more of that if, they, if that's something that we decide is a, is a good thing. So there you go. Um, moving on to the next section, um, Assemblymember Gavron is going to introduce the next topic, which is complaints. Yes, this is, they we're going to drill down now on complaints. Um, what happens when things go wrong? What procedures are there? And to start us off, um, we're going to ask Dennis Lyons from the Camden Housing Association Residence Forum to just give us a few minutes of best practice, maybe. Thank you. Yep. Well, I think we'll have the bad practice first. And <laughs> <laughs> the best practice. Thanks. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to start by describing to you the complaints uh, procedure of one housing group. I'll then talk a little bit about the reality of what actually happens. Uh, I'll then talk a bit about the TRA's role in the above. And finally, I'll talk a bit about the so-called co-regulation system. One housing group's system for handling complaints is a two-stage process. First, there is the assignment and assessment of the problem with a response time initially of two days and a full written reply to be given within 10 days. There is also a promise of personal contact throughout. If a resident is dissatisfied with stage one, you can go to stage two, which is described as the final stage, and expect a final written response within 10 days. As advertised, the system sounds quite good, but in reality, residents often get stuck in the system and can wait years for complaints and problems to be sorted out. From my own experience, I can tell you about a tenant um, where it took six years to get a bathroom leak fixed. We have a couple of tenants as well with ongoing dampness problems for many years. And an egregious example of how things can go wrong is a mother and child who have endured 12 treatments for bed bugs over the course of a year. In at least two of the above sample cases, residents have had to consult a solicitor to get the housing association to act. Also, all of the advertised systems are internal. What happens if a tenant is dissatisfied with the result of stage two, for example? No advice is given as to any external appeal or recourse. I'll now talk about the TRA's role. Often a resident will consult the TRA, having gone through the whole process without satisfaction. Or they come directly to us in the first place. Why? Because they trust us and they know they will receive a sympathetic ear and helping hand. But what can we do? We can write to the housing association or try to arrange a meeting with the management and sometimes this works. But it often depends on the goodwill or professionalism of the individual housing officer whether we get anything done. In reality, there is very little that we can do to hold the Housing Association to account. In other words, the co-regulation system does not work. 
Why? Because it assumes a balance of power where none exists. So, for example, housing associations are run by professionals, while TRAs are run by resident volunteers who give generously of their time, but who lack professional expertise and access, indeed, to professional advice. Also, TRAs have no statutory rights to hold um, housing associations to account under current arrangements. We lack the legislative tools to do the job. Finally, uh, under a general climate of deregulation, housing associations have been allowed to evolve into self-proclaimed property developers and to renounce their social mission and ethos, despite the fact that they were set up, as we all know, in the first place with this mission in mind. And the fact that they have been receipt, in receipt of public funds and housing stock for many years. They have become increasingly unaccountable to tenants and regulators over time and under existing structures like the tokenistic co-regulation idea, they can pretty much act with impunity. Even local authorities now have very little regulatory power, uh, possessing only, quote, levers of influence under current arrangements. It is time to put a stop to this dangerous drift in social priorities, and we ask that you grant our specific request for reform in our proposal. Thank you. Thank you for that good start. And now we, we can have the floor open. And uh, because my eyesight doesn't go beyond the first two rows, Sean's going to take it out. I want to be fair. There's a lady in the middle on the right. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Carolyn Mandelson, and 10 years ago I bought the shared ownership, and this is it, beautiful. Today I'm homeless. I've been homeless since the 15th of April. I've been offered nothing from my council, which is Barnet. I've been offered nothing from the Housing Association. In fact, the Housing Association are your problem. The shared ownership is your problem. You come on the radio day after day saying, let's get more shared ownership, let's get people on. Well, you're not checking what's happening with the shared ownership. We are sold, I was sold, this, it's beautiful. When I moved in, my service charges were £59 per month. My rent was £400 per month. Today, my service charges are £200 per month. £200. And my rent is well over £500, £550. The, totaling that, now including my mortgage, I started off at £800, which was just doable. I was told by the Housing Association that I had to earn £22,000 in order to be able to afford the shared ownership. And that was one of the conditions. How did they come up with the figure of £22,000 and they didn't tell me that my service charges can rise from £59 to £200? They said, you should have known they would have risen. I said, of course I know them they would rise, but I expected they would rise according to inflation. Mm. Now, not only are my service charges in the sky, come and look at my building. It's 10 years old. It is filthy. It's cleaned three half an hour a week. For that, we pay now £15,000 a year. It, it, the, the, the safety doors, the security doors, three of them broken for, say, seven out of the ten years that I've lived there. The lighting broken. Pensioner had, had, a, had a replacement hip, had to throw her keys out of the front window in order for her doctor and a physiotherapist to come for six months. And do Genesis care? How many times have Genesis even met the shared owners in all this time? All they do is, and I've got figures here, facts and figures here, I've got invoices here for thousands of pounds of services that we never even got. Nobody, and nobody is bringing them to account. You guys need to bring them to account. I've been to the housing omnibus man and they pass me on to the homes and counties and they pass me to you guys and I've got every single email to show you, to prove to you. I've been to the Citizens Advice Bureau. I've been to the, the Houses of Parliament. You name it, I've been to them and nobody, nobody is listening to me. Nobody is listening to me because it's not only me. It's not only me, it's tens of residents in my building, 33 shared owners. Do you know what? If there's seven of them left now, then that, that would be a big figure. You know what you guys need to do? You need to go around every door, knock on every door and see who's living there in the council properties. See if, it, if, if the real person who's named on the list is actually living there. You could have housed everybody from Grenfell and, I, and I'm willing to go around and knock on every single door for you and find out who's living there. You're not making them accountable. They have to be accountable. 
Thank they you. have to be accountable. I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank there, you. That was wonderful. Yeah. Are there any more shared owners? Oh. And I thank you guys to take my name and find out why I am 60 years old and I'm on the streets. I am on the streets now, ladies and gentlemen. I've been in my car, living off friends for the last six weeks. And I'm still managing to go to work occasionally. Yeah. And do you know what I've been offered? You're not a priority, madam. I'm a diabetic, I've got panic attacks, I've got high blood pressure, and I am not a priority for anybody. Why? Because I work. The only bit of good advice I've ever had was go unemployed and you'll get help. Legal aid, I went to court seven times, I never had legal aid. I never had legal advice. Can we, can we suggest you come and see us afterwards as I well? I certainly will do. Thank you. Thank you. But you've raised some wider points yeah. too, and that's really, really helpful. Yes. Thank you. We need to, can, we, can we hear from other shared owners? Yes. Oh, no. Oh, then, yes. Social housing. Social housing. No, that's fine. Cool. That's, that's good. Okay. So, lady in the yeah. front. Yeah. Hi. This is for Dennis. Um, Dennis Lyons? Yes, correct. Hi. I might have missed what you said. Yeah. After the final complaint stayed, did, yes. did you not go to the housing ombudsman? Or yes, did, you can do, but, but that advice comes to the tenants. Mm. Tenants don't, if, if they read the complaints procedure, it, it doesn't Can you say that into a microphone so it can oh, on the webcast? Thank okay. you. I, I, I'm under the impression yeah. that, that that might be kind of illegal, not to mention the housing ombudsman. So I'll just throw that in, because as a tenant for many years, I have always gone on to the housing ombudsman and been informed of that. So I was very surprised not to hear you mention it. Yeah. So that might be actually illegal not to mention the housing ombudsman. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes. Okay. This gentleman here, you're going to have to say that. I'm reading the book. Oh, I know it's nice. You're going to have to say it. Is that going to be the answer? Hi. Hi. Yes, my name's Josh Welby. I am a tenant and I live in Hillingdon, London Borough of uh, Hillingdon. Um, I live in Hayes. Um, it took a year and a half to fix an electrical problem in my flat. Um, it, I, I am a social uh, landlord um, and the, the person who I have their flat from is a private landlord. But what I would like to suggest is to have a more maintenance staff because there's no point in uh, raising a complaint and nothing gets done for a year and a half. Yeah. I mean, uh, like that gentleman said, he had a, someone had um, six years of a leaking tap. That, to me, that's dangerous because if it was upstairs, the ceiling can collapse. Uh, and also another thing is, um, there's no point having appointments with the maintenance team if they don't turn up. Because several, several times I had appointments with the maintenance team. I waited all day and they never turned up. Right, OK. My name is... Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 My name is Pauline Hutchison. I live in Hammersmith and Fulham and I'm a leaseholder and I just want to say that I think there's some sort of common grounds here that I think service charges are inflated and I'll give you an example. We had a request for the boiler maintenance in our estate. It, it, we were paying £12,000 per annum for the service charge and then it went up to 82,000 per annum. So we queried, well, what, are we get, what happened? What are we getting for the 82,000? And they assured us that it was right. Of course. And of course, that, how and many 82,000? Sorry? How many people were paying that? Well, it was 82,000 and there's roughly 250 people. Right. So it would be shared, not, not individually. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. But, um, 
Anyway, so what we asked was, well, what are we getting, what we're getting for our money, basically? And they, it was the Hammersmith and Fulham Council actually commissioned an outside person to go around and look at the boiler, have a look, and they came back, and they came back with a whole report full of work that hadn't been carried out at all. So we were actually, we felt it was just a fraud. We were being asked to pay for services which weren't even being provided. And I think that's one example, but I think that is very common, that people are being asked to pay for services that aren't being provided. Thank you for that. And I think Sean's letting me know that we've got to move on to our next uh, next point. But of course, write your write your experience on those cards so that we can collect it up. Yeah, particularly I mean that was that was complaints and I think that's um, it's one of those things where you might want to go into more detail <laughs> as a local councillor myself, you know, I deal with a lot of casework to do with repairs and maintenance. And often it's a very long story because it's it's not been done properly. I think the service charges question is, is a really interesting one as well. Um, and whether, how, how well residents can keep an eye on how much and whether what they're being charged for is getting done is, is a big question too. Um, so moving on to um, the third topic here and we have a guest yes. via the internet and Tom is going to introduce this section again. Uh, thank you, Sean. Yeah, so this is legislative, duty, uh, le legislative duties and gaps and what change is needed to protect all residents. Um, so housing association tenants are not protected in the same way the council tenants are. So local authorities have to comply with the Equality Act uh, and freedom of information requests, whilst housing associations don't have to. Um, so we're going to discuss the legislative duties and gaps of the current system uh, and look at what ne changes are needed to protect all social housing tenants. Uh, and as Sean says, we have a speaker uh, over, the, uh, uh, over Skype, uh, I think, by video uh, call. Uh, this is uh, Paul Nima Karandaka Dasharan uh, from Race on the Agenda. Can you hear us? Can we hear you? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Hello. <laughs> Possibly some feedback there. We can hear you now. Uh, yes, so I'm going to speak on the legislative duties of the gaps and what changes are needed to protect all residents. Um, and I have been asked to draw on the issues that have emerged from our experience of working on welfare. Uh, so uh, in investigating how social housing residents are involved in the management of their homes, uh, and in looking at how they can affect changes about uh, the management of their homes, including day-to-day -day repairs, estate improvements, and budgets. Uh, one of the key legislative provisions we feel that needs to be monitored and enforced is the public sector quality duty um, in the Equality Act 2010. Um, the London Tenants Federation has highlighted uh, often the lack of collective right in legislation. Uh, and uh, having a collective right is really important in addressing systemic uh, discrimination and disadvantage and getting tenants' voices heard at policy and practice level. Um, this is not something that can be tackled by uh, merely strengthening individual rights. Uh, and the PSCB, uh, the, the public sector quality duty, comes um, the closest to providing um, some sort of collective right uh, in that it uh, requires public authorities to look at uh, the disproportionate impact of their decisions on uh, vulnerable groups and this also involves meaningful consultation and engagement with those who would be impacted by the decisions made. Um, in the uh, issues related to Grenfell and also in the provision of services uh, in the aftermath of Grenfell, um, we have found through our work a lack of compliance with the public sector equality duty. Uh, so we uh, support uh, the London Tenants Federation's recommendation to uh, ensure that social housing landlords uh, that have contracts uh, with the mayor's office for delivering new social uh, affordable housing are compliant with the public sector equality duty. Um, however, one of the gaps we find uh, is that uh, the duty only requires public authorities to have due regard to the impact their decisions have on those who share protected characteristics. Uh, 
uh, such as race and ethnicity, disability, age, uh, sexual orientation, etc. Uh, and as such, it doesn't really look at the issues faced by residents as a result of uh, socioeconomic disadvantage, or uh, it doesn't look at a negative stereotyping of social housing residents when uh, trying to get their voices heard um, and to influence decisions. Um, so Rota believes that uh, the enforcement of the socioeconomic duty um, could provide a stronger voice for social housing tenants uh, whose voices are not heard due to barriers arising from uh, economic disadvantage. Um, a Just Fair, which is an organization we work closely with, are currently running a campaign to uh, get the government to enforce the socioeconomic duty. Uh, and uh, Just Fair will soon uh, present a report that has looked at good practices from local authorities that are voluntarily implementing the socioeconomic duty. Um, and Just Fair have found that some of the key drivers for voluntarily, for voluntarily implementing the duty include things like creating a cultural shift, meaningful impact assessments to uh, understand resident needs, um, using data effectively as a tool in decision making and accountability, uh, and engaging with uh, residents. Um, so to that end, we uh, support the London Tenants Federation's recommendation to uh, encourage wide debate on uh, the extent to which socioeconomic disadvantage and uh, negative stereotyping of social housing tenants uh, was a key issue in respect of the poor treatment of Grenfell tenants and uh, potentially of social housing tenants elsewhere. Um, due to the time constraints, I haven't been able to give you specific examples of how the failure to comply with the public sector equality duty in relation to the tragedy that happened at Grenfell and also in the aftermath um, uh, in um, providing services. Uh, and also, um, as some of uh, 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 some of you raised quite a few issues around. Um, Account holding public authorities such as a council and um, housing associations to account. Um, and uh, uh, there is potential to address some of those issues using the public sector equality. So uh, at this point, I'm open to any questions um, regarding any of the specificities of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is related to the yes the the more the London Tenants Federation's recommendations regarding the public sector equality uh, duty yes. and having and tenants having more rights uh, when that's been enforced, which I think is on the list that has gone around. Um, but we'll open it up to uh, yes, yes. Apologies if that was a bit unclear. Again. Sorry, the line uh, the line wasn't uh, she's speaking wasn't very brilliant. fast as well, which hopefully the webcast transcribers who are experts of this will be able to catch. <laughs> It was a, we yeah. apologise for the sound quality. So, so we'll we'll go to the floor. There's a gentleman just there. Um, I'm Jacob Secker. I'm the secretary of the Broadwater Farm Residents Association. Uh, just on the issue of socio-economic disadvantage as a protected characteristic, I, I believe that's what's been discussed. Uh, I think it's very important from our perspective in Haringey because we've got new buildings with um, poor doors springing up all over the place and I can't think of a bigger example of socio-economic discrimination. Um, it's, just, it's just completely unacceptable. I know it was written into the Haringey development vehicle which seems to be uh, hopefully defeated now but I mean all the new buildings they're putting up have got poor doors anyway all the planning proposals they've got poor doors yeah. it's just getting ridiculous and it's completely and absolutely unacceptable to put people behind poor doors that's discrimination it's obvious it's obvious but and I mean you have to look at the other context as well my estate there still could be demolitions on my estate we don't know what's going to happen What's going to happen to the Broadwater Farm if they knock my estate down and then they say we're going to build new housing projects for you they're all, and you're all going to be put behind poor doors? Which is where the great majority of us are going to be, unfortunately, because, our, you know, I mean, some of us earn more than others, but our incomes aren't high enough to buy, you know, a big house, 400,000, 500,000 pounds. There's not that many people in this estate who can really do that. So th this is what they're going to say. An estate which, and, uh, you know, 
uh, and a state where the majority of people are from ethnic minorities, and you're going to say, well, we're going to knock your homes down, we're going to put you all in segregated As housing. As we said at the start, we, we're, trying to, we're, we're not going to get to the regeneration side. We just want to look at yeah. the, the management side of the, of the existing stock. And you, I mean, in this particular section, what legislative changes we need. Well, if you had a legislative change to ban socio-economic discrimination, sure. okay. clearly you wouldn't have poor doors. You could not, you know, or, or lots of yeah. other things. In though. the same way, you couldn't have you couldn't have yeah. one, you couldn't have a block where you have one side of the block for white people and one side yeah. of the block for black people. That would be banned. You couldn't do that under current legislation, but you can do it under other forms of legislation. And it does, some, in some contexts, it does end up being a, a de facto racial uh, segregation anyway, to a large extent. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, do, do you want to pass it along to the person on the end? Thank you. Um, I'm from uh, Camden Federation of Private Tenants, and we run the uh, Camden Housing Association residence group that um, Dennis is a member of. I mean, we've been fighting uh, unaccountable private landlords since 1980, and I'm afraid to say the more I work with housing associations, the more I realise they're more like private landlords mm -hmm. than anything else. And I think there's two features that are at play here that are very similar to the private rented sector. A, the first one is a weak regulatory framework, mm. and the second one is expecting tenants with no power to bring their landlords to account. Mm. And yeah. we all know where that ends up, and where that ends up is a burning tower block called Grenfell, I'm afraid to say. Um, and I know that's an extreme example, but I think that's, that's the ultimate place where this kind of thing can take us. I think what there needs to be is a very serious questioning, as Dennis has rightly pointed out, of this whole co-regulation regime that's in place. If the government thinks it's working, then I'd very much like to see the evidence of that. And if it isn't working, what are the proposals to change that? And I think one of the things that needs to happen is the Homes and Communities Agency needs to have much more involvement in individual housing associations rather than this, there's a very high bar that's set by which it can get involved. And I think that's extreme detriment. Mm -hmm. So I think there very much needs to be a change of the regulatory framework to help residents bring their landlords to account. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, that you, you, I, I think you've spoken already yeah. earlier, sir, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just come to the, the gentleman over here who I don't think has, um, has spoken yet uh, this evening. My name's Richard Lee. I'm oh, here hi, as a... Hi, Richard. Sorry. I am here, though, as a, <laughs> as a council tenant in Southwark on this occasion. Um, yes. I wanted to just mention briefly on the legislative change, yeah. which, which is what this, this item is principally about. And I'd like to first of all speak in support of our, of our guest speaker by the link and to ask whether the London Assembly, the Mayor and the GLA could actually say that as a regional authority they will sign Schedule 1 of the 2010 Equality Act. The, so this is the one that brings in the potential of socio-economic uh, duty. Um, central government decided not to sign it so it hasn't been activated under devolution, why can't a number of the regional governments make a stand on this and say that we think social class has to be a key consideration under the Equality Act and we, want, we propose that we're going to sign this. So that was my, my first one and then I've only got another one and then my second suggestion is that really on the legislation side until we actually bring in a new Housing Act cent centrally supported, you know, under pressure from devolved governments, hopefully, that actually recognises housing as a public good. So that we have the right to housing in all its aspects, just as we have the right to health care yeah. and we have the right to education. When in this country will we have the right to housing enshrined in a Housing Act? And I know we're focusing very much on management and participation issues today, but within that Housing Act, clearly there could be a number of regulations which bring in the requirements on all landlords to bring in high levels of participation and inclusion in a democratic and accountable manner. Thank you. The chair has a question. Yeah, I have a question. Does either the, um, uh, Purina or Purnima or Richard know if any London councils are voluntarily starting to implement the social housing? So, sorry, the, um, the social uh, equality duty. 
the income. Yeah. Uh, socioeconomic. Socio. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, hi, um, uh, I do all three, uh, but just fair will be uh, um, releasing a report very soon, I think next month, if I'm not mistaken. And in that, they uh, have referred to the uh, different uh, local authorities that have voluntarily uh, implemented the uh, socioeconomic duty. So that is definitely a report to, uh, for, and uh, they talk about the practice and why those um, local authorities decided to uh, implement the socioeconomic duty. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we are I think we're at time for that one. section. Sorry. Section. So again, please uh, write uh, on the uh, on the cards uh, any comments that we didn't actually get in, and uh, we'll hand back yeah, to. Thank Charles. you so much. Can, yeah. Also, I mean, we've had a number of proposals there. Um, we had proposals earlier on too um, for there to be the reintroduction of the London. Uh, board for there to be um, a social housing regulator. Um, all your comments on the different legislative changes would be really yeah, useful really to, to hear as well. Which ones you, you sound like the sound of? Um, moving on to um, Assembly Member Bob, who's going to introduce our final topic. Yeah, this section is called um, "Make Resident Involvement Work." Let's share some good practice, um, and hopefully, we can hear about what what does work. Uh, we. We've spent most of this time talking about the failures within uh, the management system in uh, uh, the management regimes in London. Um, I hope we can now hear from about some of the successes. Mm -hmm. So um, we will hear from uh, two of our speakers, and they are Lee Page, who's a self-employed housing consultant, and Mike O'Sullivan, who's from the London Federation of Housing uh, Co-op. Sorry, the London Federation of Housing Co-op Tenants. and Tenants. <laughs> right. Uh, Lee. Yeah. Thanks very much. OK, as you may have heard, I'm not a tenant. I'm flattered that the London Tenants Federation thought fit to invite me uh, to speak in this forum on their behalf. Um, I've worked in the sector for 35 years, 25 of that mainly with tenant management organisations but with the general uh, participatory field as well across a number of local authorities. Um, and I have to start by saying I don't think there's ever been a halcyon time in the past where tenants have felt listened to and respected by their landlords in the social housing sector. Um, in fact a poster that came up in the, the French student demonstrations in 68 probably sums it up when they uh, said to conjugate the verb participate, I participate, you participate, we participate, they profit. Um, but there have been various legislative attempts to involve residents, going back you know, at least to 1980 and the Housing Act and the introduction of the, the Tenants' Charter. Uh, and it went through to the establishment of the Tenant Services Authority in, in 2008, which then got shut down in 2012, along with uh, the Audit Commission and various other quangos. Um, and the current, as has been mentioned, the current housing regulator has something called the Tenant Empowerment Standard. And that states that, it should, that land registered providers should support their tenants to develop and implement opportunities for involvement and empowerment, including by supporting their tenants to exercise their right to manage, supporting the formation of tenant panels or equivalent groups, the provision of timely and relevant performance information to support effective scrutiny by tenants of their landlord's performance, and providing support to tenants to build their capacity to be more effectively involved. And in all honesty, it's been as much use as a chocolate fire guard. Um, time and again, you know, we've seen the rights of tenants ebb and flow with, uh, on party political and landlord whims, almost. Um, but it has been established in various reports over the years that tenant involvement, participation, however you want to uh, term it, benefits the landlord in all sorts of ways. In 2004, the Audit Commission uh, and the Old Housing Corporation published a report which identified three specific areas of benefit. Increased accountability, improved performance, and enhanced social capital. Um, and a further study in, between, in 2014 called Tenants Leading Change backed that up. Um, one housing association reported that through their involvement of residents, 
they had achieved annual savings in the region of £2.75 million. They also reported satisfaction rates of their tenants of 97%, which is quite phenomenal, especially in London. Um, they've unfortunately now merged with another association, so I've got no information as to how that's, that's affected things. But experience and evidence shows that landlords in the social housing sector will not have meaningful dialogue with residents unless they are compelled either by strong legislation or threats to their funding or promised funding. And this is something the Mayor could, uh, has announced proposed funding for a new development. I say it should come with strings attached and that is around uh, tenant involvement to be proven within that organisation. Um, we've seen this work in the past. 1994 uh, to 96 saw a huge number of tenant management organisations developed. It wasn't a coincidence. It happened because the landlords were given increased ability to borrow under the estate actions programme to improve their estates. But they only got it through enhanced uh, resident involvement, which was demonstrated through TMOs. The question then should be, should not be, should governments, uh, government at all levels, including London-wide, encourage and require tenant involvement, but what sort of tenant involvement and what works? In my own experience, there's no good replacement for a democratic and accountable grassroots tenants organisations. People understand democracy. It works. You may not agree with it, but you, you understand how it works. Um, TRAs can and do play a huge role in supporting and developing strong communities. Evidence, as long as your arm on that. And when they get together to form borough-wide or landlord-wide organisations, they have that strength in the shared knowledge uh, and numbers which can amplify their voice and ensure that they're heard. Previously, we've seen landlord-wide tenants federations funded through small weekly levies on the rents. Um, which enabled those groups to self-organise. Uh, and, and some of that sort led to the formation of what is now the London Tenants Federation, who, who also achieved funding for 10 years from uh, what is now, well, we used to be the Association of Local Gov Government. Now, that meant that democratic structures within social housing landlords were quite widespread from grassroots levels right through to borough or organisational wide. And they worked at senior strategic levels and it had impacts. This best suited tenants' needs and gave them an ability to hold their landlord to account, but unfortunately many landlords didn't like it and we've seen them disappeared and, and few now remain, as Pat alluded to earlier. Within the local authority structure, we've moved to a, a cabinet structure. It removed the housing committee, which was seen as uh, a good way of getting in a, a senior level. The mergers of housing associations have seen structures ripped up and torn apart as new organisations come together, and they're, they're massive. Big doesn't work. I understand they like using what they call big data, but it doesn't deliver necessarily. It's a tool, but it doesn't replace actually speaking to people who live in your homes. The Hackett report last week was, most, was the most recent of many which have advocated increased tenant involvement. Now, we can't allow what happened to Grenfell to happen again. We can't let this be another moment where a landlord's responsibility to listen to their tenants is briefly the topic of the moment and subsequently forgotten about. We have an opportunity to embed the right of tenants to be heard in how we regulate and fund councils and housing associations. And I think we should start now here in London. Thank you. Thank you, Leek. Uh, Mike, if you could now join us. Evening, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Mick O'Sullivan. Uh, I'm a housing cooperative tenant and I'm chair of the London Federation of Housing Cooperatives. Uh, before I start, I just have a, one question for the committee, and it's not a trick question. Okay. How many members of the committee are homeowners or mortgage payers? One, two, three. Uh, no, roughly just two, two, just two. <laughs> that roughly reflects the, uh, yeah. uh, the proportion of people in this country who, are, who own their own properties. It's the mainstream tenure in England and homeowners tend to be highly satisfied with their homes. So uh, what is a housing co-op? Uh, housing cooperatives are men member controlled organisations which share the following characteristics. Only residents and potential residents can be members of a housing cooperative. 
Members elect their boards, chosen principally, but not, uh, but not always from their own mon- number. Boards, also called management committees, are accountable to their members, and board members can be removed by the residents. There are roughly uh, about 150 housing cooperatives in London, many of them registered providers, that means housing associations in their own right. They are mostly small organisations in Britain, averaging about 60 units each, but they can range in size from one shared house to a community gateway uh, with managing and controlling thousands of uh, properties. By and large, housing cooperatives stopped expanding and growing in England when grant for any new build uh, was withdrawn from them in the early uh, 90s and focused instead on the uh, 50 largest housing uh, associations. But their numbers are growing in Wales with the help of the Welsh Government and there seems to be a very flourishing uh, sector there. There are many different types of housing cooperatives, short life housing cooperatives, uh, ownership housing cooperatives, community gateways, co-housing groups, just to name a few. I won't go into the details what they all are, it would take all night. On the continent, housing cooperatives provide, in certain countries, roughly about 30% of all residential accommodation and have been associated uh, with uh, lower prices and lower, uh, and lower rents, where they are a significant uh, size in the uh, housing mix. In terms of efficiency and satisfaction, they outperform all other social housing providers. According to reports from the Joseph Rowntree from the Foundation, Islington Council scrutiny uh, into a tenant and management, or a tenant and management organisations, and of course the National Tenant Organisation's recent report on investment, not a cost. I'm happy to provide this to the committee uh, via email later on. These reports are well worth reading. Uh, they are also um, financially robust. Despite rent, uh, rents on average being lower than similar housing organisations, no housing cooperative has ever gone bust for financial reasons. Co-op members like homeowners tend to, risk, to be risk adverse and their fi- financial management reflects this. So why this high performance? Well, it's uh, quite simple, really. Officers and employees of housing cooperatives are directly accountable to their residents and obliged to fulfil their residents' priorities. In most social housing organisations, the relationship between the resident and the landlord is a Dickensian one of supplicant and benefactor, Mm. with the, uh, the landlord having all the advantages. In housing cooperatives, the resident is the landlord, just like an owner or occupier. Most housing cooperative residents are not just consulted on issues and key decisions, but they are key decision makers in their own rights, because housing cooperatives are ruled directly by their members. Housing cooperatives are also innovative organisations ahead of the curve in many uh, initiatives that we've seen lately. Uh, I'll just go through a few, just as as a few uh, examples. In Redditch, Faced with a huge shortage of social ho- uh, socially rented homes, the residents of the local housing cooperative investigated options, formed alliance with the local council and the Court Housing Association. They sent a group of their residents to Norway to look at Norway's uh, indoor build closed panel housing systems some, uh, and the houses, some of which are a century old. Subsequently, they bought some second-hand equipment, set up a factory in Redditch, employing nine people to produce these type of houses, which are built in one day in the factory and assembled in one day on site. So far, 500 units have been built from the Redditch factory in this way. Uh, Coin Street Housing Cooperative, which is just up the road there, uh, um, up the river there, I should say, uh, as well as providing social housing for the members, built their own bar and built their own very successful community uh, community centre, providing a focus for the local community around there in, in an area that's very heavily commercialised and does lack those facilities. For years, Chris, the late Chris Murrell of, of uh, Water Tower Housing Cooperative organised groups of young people to renovate derelict houses in the Hounslow area, and when they were finished, uh, the, the people who actually renovated and moved into them, providing these young people with both skills and homes at the same time. Uh, finally, uh, housing cooperative residents have real control over their housing, just like owner occupies. Give housing association tenants the same rights as housing cooperative members, and I think you will find uh, a lot of uh, the problems associated with these organisations will evaporate. Democracy works. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we've, we've just got a little amount of time for questions down here. So, uh, if we just wait for the microphone to come to you. Hi. 
Um, Martin Dumont, Chair of Lanestone Housing Co-op. But pertinent to this uh, discussion, uh, I was a tenant participation and tenant management officer for three different local authorities between 1989 and I left Lambeth in 2012. Um, basically, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm astounded that in the five years since I stopped working for local government in the field of tenant participation that basically everything we put in place, tenant compacts, all of the charters, all of the structures we used to have have been completely gone and forgotten. I mean, it's almost as if my working life was a complete waste of time. Oh. If I wasn't living in a housing car and spent most of my time doing that, then basically I would really feel depressed. But, I mean, I think, you know, the thing is to say there's enough expertise in this room to put back some of the stuff that basically seems to have gone loose without basically even doing anything more than going down to my basement and dragging out a copy of Camden's Ken Tenant Compact, which I found the other day. The other thing I would say is, um, in terms of the overall stuff, I mean, in all the time I worked, I, worked, I went through the door of a housing office in Newham to start my career in 1989 and left in, say, 2012 in Lambeth. Witnessing the managed decline of social housing, I think, is one of the most depressing things, and I grew up in a council house in the 60s, It's one of the most depressing things I think I've actually seen in the entire of my adult life. And if we don't do something to reverse that, by investing in council housing and stop backing this idiotic idea of home ownership being the only form of tenure that's basically deemed to be worthwhile, then we are storing up really serious problems for the future. I mean, I don't have kids, but my nieces and nephews are looking at a future I think is absolutely abysmal. And the fact that we'll have a generation that are worse off than our, my parents, etc., is, I think, a disgrace and something we should all basically hold ourselves to count to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and, and debates. And it's a, a question for either Pat, Ron, or, or Lee. So a, every estate I've been to have always kind of had a group of tenants who are doing good stuff to make the estates better for everybody who lived there. M might be a kind of full cooperative. It might be. It might be a bingo club. What what we've heard from all the speakers is the withdrawal of the funding. Withdrawal of funding from tenants associations. We withdraw all the funding from people who want to become uh, tenant managed. The London Tenants Federation kind of has to, um, you know, try and hop from grant funding to, to grant funding. Um, Southwark's lucky in that it's got an overall, um, it's got an overall umbrella body that kind of helps coordinate and actually run a very effective campaign on the London and, and, and oh, sorry on the Housing and Planning Act. So, a question for one of the, the panel members. What, what, what can the GLA do to help? Well, we, we've got a summary coming from Pat, who's scribbling um, <laughs> right at the end. Um, and I'm assuming that's, that will include some demands to the GLA. Does that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just nodding. We'll, we'll make sure that that's the point of our investigation. Please, please, so, yeah. yes. One more question. Hey, Mr. My name is uh, M. Bakari from Wotan Forest. I'm the chairman of my Miss Court, uh, Miss Court Thierry, South Lake Um I think the, the motto of this country and tradition, as well as equally the pride of this country, is democracy. And I'm sure there are so many borough in this London that they don't respect that tradition anymore. The majority of the council in London, they are bully. It wasn't like that before. The tenants, representative, who leave their homes to represent tenants without being paid voluntarily, and the council used to respect them in those days. I'm talking of 90 because I've been the chair of my place for the past 23 years, and I've been involved for the past 25 years. I've been board member of Wotan Forest before, and I've been the chairman of South Leightonstone Contra Panel, so I'm the member of my LTF. But nowadays, the tenants and the council, they're not related anymore, because we are the mirrors who could reflect the bad and good of the council. And when you look at it in this area, they don't want to know anymore. They don't want to know at all. All they want to know is, you're going to do this, and they will do it. 
they don't want us to involve because all the boroughs, they are first cousin. All the boroughs in this London, they are first cousin. They communicate each other. Before, we're happy. And the contractor between us, between ten, uh, tenants and the uh, landlord, we are friendly with the staff, we are friendly. But nowadays, they distance us. They don't even want us. We are just like, uh, how can I put it? Minus no plus. We are just like dumb show. It's just, just a uh, formality that they kept us there. They call it resident involvement. That's nothing, it's not in their dictionary. It's not in their dictionary when you look at it. So in that respect, when you look at it in this area, we are just sitting down here, but we are nothing to the council because they don't listen to us anymore. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> perfect timing for us as well. Literally bang on. Uh, <laughs> so we, we now have 10 minutes, that clock's a little fast, um, until seven o'clock on the dot to finish off the meeting. Um, I, I'm gonna introduce Pat to sign up to finish up in a second. First of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's spoken. Everything you've, every word you've said will go down in our in our records and will be looked at by us. Anything else you want to say, please write it down on the comment sheets and send it in. Um, I wanted to ask a question of people in the room while we have you here, um, and bearing in mind what some of the recent speakers have just said, and is how many of you in the room have been called a troublemaker, have had your efforts <laughs> belittled by your landlord to stand up. This is a, high, a majority of people in the room and they're raising their hands. Um, and I can, you know, I have too. Uh, <laughs> I like troublemakers. And this is a good thing. So this is exactly, this is, we, we approve of troublemakers and we, we're glad you came to speak to us. Um, we've heard a lot of things today. We've heard a lot of stories. Um, and a lot of solutions put forward. And I think the most powerful one we've heard is, is just the word democracy. democracy. Democracy, democracy, democracy. Real power for residents seems to be what people want. How we achieve that, whether it's from regulations from above, pressure from below, uh, whether it's the mayor or the government, we, we want to hear your views and I think perhaps some concrete suggestions to bring forward to us now. But just to say this has been really... Democracy and respect. Well, with democracy comes respect. I think this is the root cause, isn't it? So let's, let's hear from Pat now, who has a summary of the, the demands she's putting forward to the GLA and how she thinks we can help. Well, that's not exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> you, 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 you've got this summary of our demands to the GLA on a piece of paper, actually. I think you've all got that on your seats, and I did mention that at the beginning, but I just want to make a few comments responding to some of the points that have been made in the discussion, if you don't mind me doing that. Um, first of all, I just want to give credit to my own landlord, which is a tiny housing association with only 400 properties, which does give us an annual grant towards the running of our Tenants and Residents Association, even though it only has a quarter of the people on our estate. And perhaps this should be an example to all those big housing associations that make it almost impossible to get any money out of them. The other two uh, housing associations on our estate are both big, and they make us jump through hoops to get any money, and we usually don't get it. Um, the, the second point is, um, I thought that the points that were made by Richard Lee were new points about legislation that ought to be remembered and pursued. And um, I would like to recommend that the GLA has a very good look at them. Uh, the third point I wanted to make was that, uh, just to echo what Lee said when he was up here, there's no substitute for democratic and accountable tenants associations and borough-wide federations. And the loss of those has been a really serious blow to tenants all over London. And we ought to ask for the mayor's support in trying to pressurise the boroughs to take a much better view and re-establish those. Um, I, I just wanted to make a point about our speaker on shared ownership because I felt that um, she highlighted a question that is not often raised, which is what is happening to all these shared ownership properties all over London that are still being built? And it also um, 
bears out a point that's been made by some of the other speakers, which is the pitfalls of regarding home ownership as the answer, as the be-all and end-all to housing problems, and in fact forcing people into home ownership or part home ownership, who in the end will not be able to afford it. And the thing that's forcing them into it is the shortage of public housing, of council housing. That's what's forcing them into it. Um, I just want to speak about myself. I'm a lifetime social housing tenant. I've never owned a home or had a mortgage. My parents never owned a home or had a mortgage. They also were council tenants. And I want to speak up for publicly provided housing as the best way of providing good housing for a very large section of people. At the time when I got my council home, I was a teacher and I got a council home. And you wouldn't get a council home as a teacher now. And uh, that, to me, to me, is a, a great worsening of the situation. And um, recently I saw a blog where they pointed out that the number, the pr pr proportion of people who are homeowners now is the same as it was in round about 1979 or 1980. And what's actually happened is that people have been forced into insecure and expensive private rented housing instead. That's been the great growth sector in housing that has, has uh, uh, sort of mushroomed as the social and council housing has, uh, has uh, diminished. So um, I think that's the sort of context that we're seeing all this in. And finally, I just want to say, it. for 18 years now, I've been chair of the Tenants and Residents Association of my estate, just like a lot of the other people here. But my estate is... I think there are a lot of these estates about, actually, but they don't seem to get any recognition. We're a four-landlord estate. We've got three housing associations and the council for 400 properties. An absolutely ridiculous situation, of course. And, uh, you, you know, we can ask questions about why that was ever allowed to happen when our, our council estate was knocked down and rebuilt in the 1990s. But the important thing is that we refused from the start to be divided. We are one tenants and residents association. Um, and there were attempts to divide us and there were attempts to hive certain sections off. Um, and I feel that our unity has been our strength. We've had all the problems everybody else is talking about, of finding it difficult to get uh, services and things like that, but we have also had victories, and I'd say every single one of those victories is because of that very factor. So I would recommend that to everybody. Thank you.